Hello, everyone. Welcome to Her Street 2.0. We were just listening to the finale fourth movement of Amy Beach's Symphony in E Minor, also known as the Gaelic Symphony. And I know they always say, let's start at the very beginning, a very good place to start. But I thought, ah, let's go to the end. So that was the very end of Amy's symphony. Um, so again, welcome to Her Street 2.0. My name is Kendra Harder. My pronouns are she, hers. And this class is being hosted by the Saskatoon Symphony Orchestra. So I would love to extend a huge thank you to the SSO and Executive Director Mark Turner. And now I would like to begin by acknowledging that the land where we are gathered and live streaming from is Treaty 6 territory, the traditional territory of the Cree, Dakota, Nakota, Dene, Soto, and the homeland of the Métis. We pay our respect to our indigenous ancestors of this land and reaffirm our relationship with one another. We encourage you to also take a moment to consider the indigenous land on which you reside and offer a sense of gratitude to the indigenous peoples who stewarded this land and water long before us. So helping me today on tech once again is the wonderful Matthew Praxis. Yay, Matt. So if you have any technical issues, please send him some messages in the chat and he can help you out there. And also, we would love it if you would all put where you're from in the chat. We'd love to see where everybody is joining us from. Um, you'll also notice down there, there's also a little bubble that says Q&A. If you have any questions throughout the class, please feel free to pop them in there. Anytime throughout the class, that's fine. But I'm going to wait until the end of the class to get to them. So this week, we are taking a look at the symphony, the so-called male sacred space, the epitome of compositional creation and grandeur. Um, and so I just want to also start with this little quote from the book Women in Music. Musicologists have emphasized the development of musical style through the most progressive works in genres of a period. Whereas most women composers were not leaders in style change, in part, at least, because they were excluded from pro professional positions that engendered new developments. And the reason I bring this up is this is a big reason why we don't always hear about female composers, because the focus in musicology is often on the big dramatic changes that we see from a Berlioz or a Beethoven or um like a Tchaikovsky like that's what they're focusing on but that's too narrow of a view when we're looking at music and so we wanted to open up and broaden because well what were the you know what good are knowing about the changes if we don't know what else was going on and additionally there's amazing music that's going on outside of the big changes um so that's sort of why I brought up that little quote so I'm going to bring up a PowerPoint here for us today. So I'll start with what is a symphony? So what is this big, amazing thing that people are so obsessed about and calling the epitome of composition that are um, critiquing women for not having written one or, or whatnot? Um, so a symphony from um, a textbook called A History of Western Music is a large work for orchestra, usually in four movements. So the symphony emerged in the classical era, and it is derived from the Italian op opera Sinfonia, or Overture. Um, and so by about 1700, many opera overtures used a three movement structure of fast, slow, fast, so the allegro, a short lyrical andante, and a finale in a dance rhythm, such as a minuet or a jig. 
Sound familiar? Um, so these overtures had no musical connection to the opera that they introduced and could be played as independent pieces at concerts where I know when we think of overtures, or at least when I think of overtures, like musicals, right, usually they're referencing lots of different material um, that's going to be inside of the musical. That wasn't what was going on with these opera overtures. So the earliest symphonies, the early symphonies were written around 1730 by composers in Milan and surrounding region of Lombardy in northern Italy. And these were three movements, just like the Sinfonia, following that fast, slow, fast tempi for the different movements. And they were relatively short. They were less than 10 minutes. And the early symphonies were just scored for violin one, two, viola, and bass. And the bass part usually comprised of celli, bass violi, and likely a harpsichord and a bassoon. So as the symphony progressed, um, and became uh, more popular. It spread to north to Germany, Austria, France, and then England. Um, sorry. So then, yeah, we start seeing developments in the symphony. So a lot of composers would add a fourth movement, um, adding a minuet to, and trio after the slow movement. And Johann Stamitz was the first symphonic composer to consistently use what will become sort of the standard four movement plan for the symphony, um, as is listed here in the PowerPoint. He also started expanding the orchestra. So, pardon me, he added two oboe and two horn to the score. And so um, in the 18th century, the orchestra was about maybe 30 to 40 people. And so with that size of forces, um, the volume and the dynamics weren't so loud that um, you couldn't still be in the salon or in those large living rooms where people would host their their concerts and their chamber works in the 18th century. But near the end of the classical era, musical life started to move towards the public concert. Um, and this is kind of one of the really big innovations of the 18th century in music. Um, and so these concerts, they were um, like performers and composers, they were appearing before a paying public. And so these concerts, usually the symphony was the was the first thing on the bill. It was the big, the big item. And there would still be the sinfonia, um, opera arias. And near the end of the century, we would see um, concerto work. So that's um, a solo instrument such as a piano or a violin back, um, backed by the symphony and then it's showing off the virtuosity of the players. Um, interestingly, um, women often did appear as the soloists in the concerti, um, but they were rarely hired as members of the established performing groups. And in all honesty, it took about a century and a half for women to start really being accepted and allowed into the major symphony orchestras. It's so like, yeah, like 1950s, it starts to, you know, become a little bit more common. Um, during World War II, um, a lot of women then, of course, they had the positions in, in the symphonies while the men were off at war, but when the men came back, they kind of all demanded their spots back. Anyway, I digress. So by the late 1700s, the symphony was considered the summit of instrumental music. Um, and then as the public concert light developed, the symphony became the most important genre of orchestral music. And so then as a result, the 19th century composers approached the writing of the symphony with greater deliberation than their predecessors. And I'll unpack that a little bit. Um, here, I just wanted to show you a table from a textbook of mine from one of the colleges I went to. Um, so this here is just looking at the difference in the size of orchestras between Haydn and Beethoven. So we see here with Haydn's uh, symphony from 1792, um, it's it's still a little bigger than Johann Stamitz's that I mentioned. And then we get to Beethoven and we're starting to see a whole lot more woodwinds. Um, we're adding in the trombones and the brass. Um, and with the timpani actually, with both of these um, sized orchestras, there's usually just like two, and this is really a big generali generalization, and they would be just pitched to sol and do of the key of the symphony, or or one and five. Um, oh yeah, and then this is actually quite interesting. If you look on the Haydn orchestra side, under the strings where it says cellos and double basses, 
they were always playing the same part, but just in different octaves. Whereas once we're getting into Beethoven's orchestra, you can see that they're on separate lines because um, they're actually providing different roles and different lines um, some of the time. Um, here, um, I've just got some examples here. So on the left, we have uh, Johann Stamitz um, Symphony there, but then on the right, we have um, Symphony Number no. 7 by Shostakovich. And you can see just how much more um, instrumentation is going on with these pieces, um, even at the percussion. So if, um, I don't know if you can see my mouse, but if you follow down to the third bracket, um, you can see all these other percussion instruments, right? So with Beethoven, we just had those two timpani, which shows to Kovic, right? We've got timpani, we've got tambourines, we've got different types of drums. Um, and this just keeps growing and growing as we're, as, as the symphony is expanding. So in the Romantic era, um, another thing was the composers were now taking time to gradually expand these instrumental forces, plus giving more time for their ideas to play out. So like with Haydn and Mozart, their symphonies were approximately 20 minutes, where when we look at like a Tchaikovsky or a Brahms, um, those symphonies are at least two times that length. And so consequently, um, Haydn would have written about 100 symphonies where like Schubert, Dvorak, Beethoven, they wrote nine, Brahms only wrote four. So this, this genre is growing and growing as um, and developing as uh, 18th and 19th centuries go on and, and 20th century, of course. But the big question for us is, well, where are the women in all of this development? What, like, what were they writing symphonies? What's going on? We know that women were composing. Um, you know, we, if we're going back to the 18th century in 1700 to 1750, we're starting to see women emerge more as composers of instrumental music. Um, but they would more often be writing for small chamber groups for those um, small private salon um, concerts because that's what they were allowed. That was what was deemed acceptable for, for the woman was to be um, creating music that was for domestic consumption by amateur musicians. Um, but there, like, there were some 18th century women who ventured into composing in these large genres, such as Mariana Martinez, as we talked about um, in the fall there. Um, but for the women who did the writing for the orchestra in 18th and 19th centuries, like they rarely had the opportunity to have their works heard and to receive feedback because they did not have access to those ensembles. And this is actually a really key um a key point in developing as a composer is having that access to musicians to having your music heard i mean because one why would you write music if nobody's going to play it right we want to share our music we want it to be heard but uh, also when you get to hear your music you get that feedback you get to learn about um like you you, you learn more about your your own personal writing experience or writing abilities um, and things that you want to progress on. Um, like for example, this last year, um, I had the absolute privilege to get to work with the Symphony Core 5 wind players um, on my wind quintet. And so they offered me tons of feedback and we got lots of really good changes into the score and just things to help me understand what I was doing better. Uh, but then this is just hilarious. So. Um, I thought uh, the Strata Festival is finally able to do last year's concert. Yay, small little plug there, Strata Festival, look it up. Um, anyway, but I'm looking at the score and it's been a year since since I wrote this and I can just see how much more I have learned since I wrote that. And I'm just looking at it, I'm like, oh, that's embarrassing. If I had, if I had met with Mistral Five before then, this would have changed the score. And so it's those kind of opportunities that allow us to learn as composers and so if you don't have that, it's really difficult. So back to 18th and 19th centuries. And so also to that, to that effect of, of getting to hear your music, there's also the, um, the issue of education, right? So you need that education to know how to write for those forces. It isn't something that you're just born with. Like you do have to study, you do have to learn. And in general, women were not thought to need or deserve the musical training considered essential for aspiring male composers. 
Um, so I, I came across this very, um, very good op-ed by Robert Gross called Regarding Women Composers, Is the Patriarchy Stupid? Um, I've listed it on my website. I highly recommend the read. It's got some very good points in it. Um, but I love what he writes here. While composition belongs to no gender, the patriarchy is a man's game. Why are there fewer great women composers in history? Because patriarchy has historically suppressed and oppressed women composers and composers of other marginalized groups. And we're still doing it. And like this was written in 21st century. So as we move into the 19th century with the symphony, sorry, I'm jumping all over the place. Um, as we move into the 19th century, um, we're still seeing those same issues with education, access to instrumental forces still being prevalent. And as the symphony is moving out of the salon and into the public concert hall, there's even less chance for a woman to get to hear her music performed because she is not going to have access to those public halls. Um, that was like a man's domain. So very few symphonies came from women's pens pre 20th century, um, and even concertos were a bit of a, an exception. Um, so I've got a few quotes coming up here of just some of the things that prevalent 19th century minds were saying, things that people were seeing and were the general society viewpoints on women. So George Upton writes, not only are women too emotional and lacking in stamina to write music, but a woman's mind simply cannot grasp the scientific logic of music making. In a widely distributed music history text from the 19th century, it reads, all creative work is well known as being the exclusive work of men. And this was Emil Baumann, and this text was originally in German, but then also translated into English and distributed um, throughout the United States and England. And then 19th century psychologist Havelock Ellis writes, there is certainly no art in which women have shown themselves more helpless. And he asserted that their lack of achievement was proof of their biological inferiority. Their lack of achievement has nothing to do with that. It has to do with the access to education, to resources, as we've been talking about. And so this is the kind of, I guess, this is the world, this is the viewpoints of society that women are living in. Can you imagine trying to do anything creative or just different with, with this sort of talk going on about around you? Like that would be impossible. And the unfortunate thing is, we still see this kind of talk today around other groups of people, such as our BIPOC um, fellow individuals, um, trans and non-binary people. And we need, if we see this kind of um, talk and conversation, we need to stop it. Um, because I cannot imagine trying to, to, to be myself or to be a human present in society if these kind of things are being said. Um, anyway, soapbox aside, I guess this whole class is kind of a soapbox, but um, so women composers, they had to combat all of these stereotypes, um, you know, of, of the dilettante and the piano girl, which were the traditional musical accomplishments of, for women. And in the late Victorian era, women were still thought to be better suited to the small, light genres of salon music. So, you know, they might be accepted a little bit as a composer, but just, just those little songs. But very, very happily, we see women writing symphonies in the late 1800s. Um, there's Louise Farrink, Augusta Holmes, Cecile Chaminade, but public opinion kept holding them back. Um, for example, Cecile Chaminade had some larger works, but it was the, her smaller works, her songs, her art songs, her piano pieces, um, where she had her fame. And these were ideally suited for popular consumption because they were the genres considered within a woman's sphere. And, um, and that was like with publications and stuff. So that's how they could kind of um, make a living as a composer. Um, I love this quote. Uh, this is from Florence Edith Sutro, who was the first woman in the United States to receive a doctorate of music and the first student in women's law class of, at the University of New York. The dogma that great intellectual effort, 
strong reasoning and original production is within the capacity and the proprietary rights of men is doctrine, which it must be remembered has been laid down by men. And, and that's where these viewpoints are coming from. And so, uh, sorry, I need to skip some of my notes here. Uh, just bear with me for a second. Um, so for the women who were um, creating the symphonies, they also had to contend with reviewers and critics. And um, these reviewers were mostly male and they would, they would criticize this music by saying that women fail to conform to the traditional symphonic structural procedures or they would, um, you know, have this double standard, or sorry, they would have this, this is different. Um, they would have, they would say that their, their music was too feminine, but then they would also criticize them for being too masculine and for writing like a man, that they were like betraying the women by doing this and they were trying to be like a man and that was a bad thing. Um, but then there would be this double standard where um, they would cr criticize women's music for being too feminine where someone like Chopin, who wrote feminine music, was credited for having a full range of emotional expression. So despite all of this, um, we get these amazing women like Amy Beach, who we're going to talk about, and Ethel Smythe, who we talked about last year. Um, and they were astonishing audiences and critics alike with their powerful symphonic works, which in no sense exhibited the limitations normally associated with women's work. So that's a little bit of background on the symphony and some of the, the prejudice that we see against women in regards to the symphony. But we wrote symphonies. So Amy Beach, um, full name is Amy Marcy Shaney Beach, and she was the first woman in the US to have a successful career as a composer of large scale art music. In her lifetime, she was known as the Dean of American Women Composers. And she's considered this paradox of the passionate Victorian. I love that. You know, she appeared to be a model of Victorian propriety, but her music reveals a passionate inner life. So Amy was born in New Hampshire. She was an only child of Charles Abbott Shaney, who was a wealthy industrial industrialist, beg pardon, and her mother was Clara Imogene Shaney, and she was a gifted amateur singer and pianist. By the age of two, Amy could sing a large repertoire of music and could also improvise an alto harmony to her mother's soprano line. She demonstrated perfect pitch in an early year, at an early life, and I love this, she would cry whenever her mom would sing a song to her in the wrong key. By age four, she could play any music that she heard um at the piano and she begged her mother to play but her mom hold off on held off on teaching for her until she was four and her mother was her first piano teacher um so yeah by that time she could reproduce whatever she heard her mother play leaving out the notes that her hands couldn't reach um one i love this story once when visiting the country she composed three waltzes in her head then when they returned home she played them at the piano um, so she, yeah, she's already showing these amazing talents and natural propensity towards music at an early age. Um, and at age seven, she had her first public recital playing Handel, Beethoven, and Chopin and some of her own works. In 1875, the family moved to Boston and uh, she eventually made her public debut as a pianist in Boston at age 16. Um, but so to this, her parents chose to limit her training and her public performances. At the time, um, if you were show, if you wanted to have a career as a pianist, you would usually go abroad to Europe to study. But her parents didn't want to send her abroad. Um, so, and part of this was because women were still perceived as intuitive musicians, um, not capable of intense training. But they did still give her some good uh, piano instruction. She studied with Ernst Parabo and Carl Behrman. Um, so after her public debut in, in Boston, um, she started to create this real um, a following in, in Boston as a composer and as a pianist. Um, three months later, she played her first solo recital at Chickering Hall. And within the next year, she would play with the Boston Symphony Orchestra and the Theater Thomas Orchestra. 
and um, all the critics believed that she would have a brilliant concert career. Um, but as for composition, um, she didn't get any, she only had one year of formal study with Junius Welch Hill, um, while her parents were okay with giving her the piano lessons, uh, less so with the composition. Um, so otherwise, she was mostly self-taught as a composer, um, particularly in orchestration and fugue. And so she underwent some very rigorous self-study with books. Um, and this is great. She translated Hector Berlioz's treatise on orchestration into English. Like, not only did she just teach herself orchestration by reading this treatise, she also translated it from French into English. Um, she would also examine scores and compare them to performances that she heard with the Boston Symphony Orchestra. And she writes, I copied and memorized whole scores of symphonies. It was like a medical student's dissection. So by 1885, at age 18, she was married to who, um, Dr. Henry Harris Aubrey Beach, who was about 42 or 43 at the time. Um, afterwards, some sources say she chose to be known as Mrs. H.H.A. Beach. Um, I want to question that, but I don't have any, any confirmation on, on my skepticism. Anyway. But Henry was a surgeon and society physician, amateur singer, pianist, poet, and painter. Um, but he did not believe that a career as a professional piano was appropriate for his wife. So he persuaded her to end her career, limiting any performances she had to just once a year for charity. Um, she reluctantly agreed to this, and she also agreed not to teach or accept money for her performances. However, Henry did encourage her to focus on composition, but he still didn't want her to have a composition teacher. Um, you know, I think he feared patronizingly that it might change her creative voice because we're seeing that um, intuitive composer thing. Um, unspoken but obvious is Dr. Beach's assumption that his wife's musical competency is intuitive, a gift, not a learned skill, received, not achieved. And so the, this, this is all with the social view that Amy as a woman was ill-equipped by, by biology or temperament to benefit from rigorous training. But I don't want to vilify Henry because, um, you know, he was, he still encouraged her to compose and it was he more than anyone that encouraged Amy to compose in the larger forms of the symphony and the piano concerto. Um, he also, his connections, high society connections also helped her make connections with musicians that would play her music. Um, one of her pieces, Ecstasy, eventually had over 1,000 performances. Can you 1,000? Like, I get excited if something of mine gets played twice. <laughs> 1,000 performances. So, yeah. Um, so over the next 25 years, she still, she gave her occasional concert while composing. And in this time, she composed more than half of her catalog. So uh, we're coming into her larger works. And so most of her larger orchestral works were sort of written around the same time. Um, in 1892, she wrote her Mass in E flat. In 1893, Festival Jubilate, which was um, performed at the World's Columbian Exposition in Chicago in 1980, or sorry, 1893. Um, and then in 1896, uh, she wrote her, sym her symphony in E minor. Um, so, oh, that's on the wrong slide. Oh, here we go, sorry. So about the Gaelic symphony. So she wrote this at age 29. Um, and so, so she, her basis, why we call it the Gaelic symphony is she noticed that a lot of New Englanders had um, emigrated from Ireland, Scotland, and England. So she drew a lot, she drew a lot on those types of folk melodies. So at the premiere, um, it was treated with a bit of ambivalence. Like it was, it was very high praise, but it was kind of, it was a controversy because um, like there was a woman, she wrote a symphony. What do we do about this? And um in the critiques and in the reviews there everything was sort of 
um, talked in gendered terms, as in um, it has not the slightest trace of effeminacy, but is distinctly and thoroughly masculine in effect. Um, critic Hale actually, critic Philip Hale writes, it is fortunately not necessary to say of the Gaelic symphony that it is an incredible work for women. Such patronage would, is uncalled for and it would be offensive. This symphony is the fullest exhibition of Mrs. Beach's indisputable talent. But then he goes on to criticize her orchestration and blames this on her sex. Um, you know, he feels it's heavy handed and he thinks, um, he, he writes, a woman who writes for orchestra thinks, I must be virile at all costs. And he's, and he's referencing heavy orchestration. Um, but to that, I would just really like to point out that Amy is self-taught in terms of orchestration. She didn't have that teacher guiding her through examples and, and have lots of other opportunities to learn about orchestration in that kind of setting. Um, so to write a symphony, being self-taught in orchestration is a pretty amazing deal. And if I listen, I mean, when I listen to it, I don't feel it's heavily orchestrated, over, heav over orchestrated, big pardon. Um, I think it's amazing. But again, there's lots of really good um, praise around this. Like George Chadwick quite loved the piece. Um, he <laughs> he said he could call her one of the boys. I don't know if that's a great thing, but okay. Um, but the, this critical reception of Beach's symphony symbolizes the ambiguity and tensions that accompanied the emergence of women from the parlor and into the professional world. Um, and all of the critical assessments of her music of the time, they dwelt on the fact that she was a woman. Um, and so therefore her music could not be compared to the mainstream male composers, which is really unfair. And um, ugh, enough on that. Let's listen to some more of that symphony. Um, it's so good. So Matt's gonna set up a re uh, the recording here of the second movement of the symphony in E minor, opus 32. Um, and it's really dramatic. I love how it, um, yeah, you're going to be taken on quite a ride. Okay, he's got it set up. He's going to play it. I'm going to stop talking.
That is so good. I love when it just starts building up and then it just, oh, it's so good. Love it. So, unfortunately, Amy's husband died in 1910. But once that happened, Amy took control of her career again. Um, in 1911, she moved to Munich and she started an international career. She relaunched her uh, career as a, uh, as a concert pianist and as a composer. Um, while she was there, she got to um, learn a little bit more about what was, what was going on in the world of new music. So um, she started um, experimenting with whole tone scales, Wagnerian chromaticism, French modern style, um, and progressive tonality and atonality. And her years in Europe were extremely success successful and helped establish an international reputation. Um, but on the eve of World War I, um, Amy returned to America and she was actually already booked for a 1914-1915 concert season. Um, so from then on until about age 70, she, um, yeah, she had a, a very full life as a composer and as a concert pianist. Um, you know, in the winter, she would have concert tours. And then in the summer, she would devote her time to composition. Um, she would spend her summers at what's called the McDowell Colony, which is in New Hampshire. And it's a fellowship in residence um, sort of program where um, it's a retreat for artists and writers and composers. And so for 20 years, um, Amy did the, the composer in residence or the fellowship in, re in residence there at the McDowell, at Mc the McDowell Colony. I'm so sorry, guys. I need to drink more of that coffee. Um, but I love this quote from her. I have literally lived the life of two people, one a pianist and the other a writer. Anything more unlike than the state of mind demanded by these two professions, I could not imagine. When I do one kind of work, I shut the door, sorry, I shut the other up in a closed room and lock the door. And I can totally understand that. Like the type of focus you need on practicing um, on a on a craft like with, for me with the guitar it's so different than when you are composing because there you kind of like you write something and this is my experience and you kind of go off into space and you think about it and you write and you go back and you write some more and then you think about it and anyway i love that quote um okay i need to skip ahead here um so she did a lot to help other musicians uh she taught younger musicians um, in 1924, she became the co-founder and the first president of the Society for American Women Composers, co-founded with Mary Howe, and she served as the head of several national organizations, including the Musical Educators National Conference and the Music Teachers National Association. Almost all of her compositions were published, a situation that was unheard of for a woman at her time. Like, that is amazing. Um, but she is remembered most for her songs and so on the piano and her art songs, um, despite being the, you know, credited as the first woman to write a symphony. These, the, those songs are the things she's known for the most. And she did only write the one symphony. Um, but so this I find kind of interesting and it'll kind of help us understand how somebody who did something so amazing can kind of be forgotten and what we have chronicling um, Amy's sort of popularity really helps us understand that a bit. So her works declined in popularity in her lifetime because they seemed dated in the 20th century. Um, and then after her death in 1944, her works went out of print and then were almost completely forgotten. In the 1970s and the 80s, there was a revival of interest in her music. And then we started to see some recordings and some scholarly studies appear. And then by the 1990s, a full scale beach renaissance was underway and her works um, have gradually become republished and nearly all of them are available now. Um, but we still see some sexism in our programming today in the 21st century, despite the beach renaissance. Um, her 150th birthday came up in 2017, but not one major US orchestra programmed her work in that season. Yet we are constantly seeing, you know, when we have the 250th anniversary for Bach and for Beethoven, they get these big concerts and it's everywhere, it's global. But there wasn't one for Amy Beach in the country of her birth. Um, 
And oh, this isn't totally related. I just love this quote and I pasted it here. It's from Ro Robert Gross with that op-ed. Um, it's easy to celebrate the already celebrated. That's neither progressive enough, nor does it make much difference. So I'm going to take a little tangent here before we get into Alice's music, because it's hard to talk about the symphony in a 21st century sense of the composition because it's not really as much of a thing that people are composing anymore. Um, like even the, in the Romantic era, we have all these other types of orchestral music coming out, like the poem poems, orchestral suites, this, that, and the other thing. Um, so there's a composer from the American Composers Orchestra that um, his name is Derek Bermel, and he noticed that there was a lot less symphonies being written by emerging composers, by composers in the 21st century. So he did some research, and these are some of the things he he heard. So uh, Gabriella Lena Frank said she's trying to get away from the title, not necessarily the form, but she says, maybe I'm rebelling against the reverential stupor that often greets the word symphony. Um, and Anthony Chung says that the term symphonic, it's kind of, it's very vague and a lot of titles even we, we see today, they're, they're dramatic. People like to give some sort of sense of what the piece is about from the title of the work. Um, and the, the noun symphony carries this huge weight of a glorious but rather specific tradition of those four movements. Um, where the adjective, as in symphonic, signifies any combination of length, instrumentation, and desire to express and communicate on a grand scale. Um, so, you know, maybe people are writing things that could be in length the same as a symphony, might even have four movements, but yeah, you don't see as many people being like, I composed symphony number six, you know, it just, we don't see that as much anymore. Um, and, and more in a practical sense, um, Andrew Norman said, that for creating a large scale work, most orchestras are for the most part not interested in commissioning or, or performing it. Um, without an effective mechanism for getting repeat performances, there's very little incentive for a composer to spend a year or more writing a great piece that will in all likelihood get one performance. Um, and that was kind of how, how it's been we're making change, things are starting to change now, but with a lot of new music from the late 20th century and early 21st, like you'd write this huge piece and it would get played once and then nobody else would pick it up because they're they're playing the old canon or maybe they're, they're, they're looking at other new works. Um, but there are some orchestras like in, in Canada, um, they're trying to communicate with each other about new works and, and see that new pieces are getting performed at all the major orchestras here. Um, so it's a trend that's happening. Um, but yeah, we can see why it's difficult for people to even write something called the symphony. Um, but as you can see, like all composers, any gender, they're just kind of seeing this, there's this weight in this, I guess, expectation of what a symphony should be. Um, so the music we're going to talk about with Alice Ping Yi Ho isn't a symphony per se in that very narrow term, but it's a grand symphonic work. And I, I love, I love Anthony Chung's thing here. Um, let me just reread re -re that. Signi um, yeah, signifies any combination of length. Sorry, length, instrumentation, and desire to express and communicate on a grand scale. I think that is a great. Um, a great way to look at it. So Alice Ping Yi Ho, she is a Chinese Canadian composer, living, um, classically trained pianist, and she is one of the most acclaimed Canadian composers of today. Um, she writes in many musical genres, um, opera, chamber music, ballet, um, and I did include in the playlist a little um, piece of one of her operas because I I was really torn about putting her in opera week, but I love the other two people in opera week. So it's like, okay, no, I'll keep I'll keep Alice here. I just put that in there because it's it her opera music is so good. Um, anyway, but she has this very proudly eclectic approach with influences from Chinese folk and operatic idioms, um, Japanese taiko, jazz, pop culture. Um, but her ongoing goal is to explore new musical styles that are provocative to the ears. Um, so Alice born, was born in Hong Kong and she grew up in her grandparents' home. 
Um, both of her grandparents liked Peking opera and Cantonese opera, and she would see lots of expert excerpts growing up. Um, and she didn't always understand the scenarios, so her grandmother would always take the time to explain them to her. She came to music at a very early age. She took ballet class and piano lessons, and she just basically grew up around classical music. Um, but this is interesting. Before she entered university, she actually wanted to be a doctor. Um, she worked very hard to get in, but she wasn't accepted into medical school. However, she did get a scholarship to study music at Indiana University. So that's where she studied music with John Eaton, and she got her undergrad there. Um, she met her husband in Indiana, and they got married, and they moved to Toronto. And there she took a master's in composition at the University of Toronto. And there she studied with uh, John Beckwith, and that's a pretty big name in Canada. Uh, so living in Toronto, um, it's a very multicultural city, and it gave her this opportunity to research Chinese music and instruments. Um, and so there's, she had this one really big turning point with an opera she, she wrote called The Lessons of Da Jing, and it combined Chinese instruments, the pipa, eru, and guzang, with traditional Baroque instruments. Um, and this is a pretty new thing in opera. Um, so that's just kind of one of the big turning points in her, in her composition career. Um, but she has produced lots of um, collaborations with different artists um, and lots of large scale works and symphonic works that reveal a collaborative spirit and an ambitious talent, but most importantly, a curious mind. Um, as I was reading about different works by Alice and trying to figure out which one to, to read, to, to show you guys, um, I just noticed that a lot of the descriptions um, showed this deep connection to her childhood growing up. Um, there was there was a song she wrote called Buddha Song, which was inspired by childhood memory um, growing up in her grandparents house um, her grandmother had a daily routine of chanting to a statue of the laughing buddha and so this piece is written in loving memory of them um, so she writes i look back into my own culture i find new sounds and new ways to communicate to the audience yet the music always reflects my own style it's important to me that the audience experiences these new sounds in ways that aren't superficial but rather in a work that has depth um, whoops, oh, sorry there. Uh, ha, 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 ha. Sorry, guys. Um, so with some of her earlier works, um, I, I got to have a little email interview with her just talking about her orchestral works. Um, and she says she really appreciates sort of this raw imagination and some miscalculations in her earlier work. Um, and she also commented on how, you know, when she started writing like in the 80s and 90s, um, they didn't have the notation and sound softwares that we have now. And so, um, yeah, there's a lot of kind of, I guess, trial and error, which she quite appreciated. Um, but now that she's worked with more orchestras and gained more experience, um, she, had, she finds she has more control of her compositions. Um, I just kind of want to repeat this from earlier. Oh, as she gained more experience, heard more of her pieces, she got better as a composer. And it was really important to have high profile orchestras playing music by women because it is one of the most ambitious projects. Um, it's this experience of working with ensembles and hearing your work played that helps you grow as a composer. Um, so Alice has never felt that um, her gender or her race were an issue with critics with reception of her music. Um, she just loves writing for orchestra and they didn't affect her negatively as a composer. Um, but she did say, however, that she re received some comments like, oh, write like a man or my music does not sound like it came from a woman. Um, she's also been shocked to hear comments that they were surprised that her music was so rhythmic and energetic because she is small built and fragile. But she took these in as compliments and just kind of laughed and like, yes, you are resilient and amazing. Um, so, but her music is just, it's so imaginative and colorful in orchestration. Um, so the piece we're going to look at today is called, one of the pieces, Actually, we're only gonna have time for the one, I apologize. Um, it's called Dark Elements and it's so good. So I'm, I'm not gonna talk too much about it so we can hear both excerpts from this one piece. Um, 
this work was created to evoke the images of the mythological forces that are found in fantasy worlds. Um, the movements are Lumina, Undina, and Flama. And the inspiration comes from like Japanese cartoon superheroes. Um, and she had a lot of fun exploring with unusual sounds um, and music languages to convey this musical journey of the underworld. Um, and she uses different like kind of combinations of solo instruments or so li, which is multiple instruments sort of soloing together. Um, and each movement is constructed with a distinct musical subject that carries a unique sound, mood, and orchestral color. Um, and she writes that the rich and rapid changing musical events from a kaleidoscope of audio images is just as if you were browsing through the colorful pages of Japanese manga. So I'm going to get Matt to set up the um, recording here for us. It's from the Canadian Music Center, um, so it's not in the YouTube playlist. Um, but the first bit that we're going to call we're going to listen to is from Movement Two, Undina. And what I love is in this little bit of the clip, um, it's the motivic thing. It's like it kind of it moves and it gains energy and then it stops, and then it moves a little bit more and then it stops, and it creates all this tension. Um, and it's so good. And I'll also talk about the third one in hopes that, and then Matt can just jump ahead to it. Um, it's called Flama. And I love it. It's got marimba and, um, oh, it's so good. So we're just gonna, if Matt can just, once that first clip is done, just skip ahead to the next one, that will be great. And then we can just really enjoy um, Dark Elements by Alice Ping Yi Ho.
Oh, I love that piece. Um, so because um, we're running out of time, I'm not going to share the other piece, but it's on her SoundCloud page. Um, I'm just going to write into the chat here um, my website where you can find full links to all of the recordings. Um, but with um, the CMC one, for some reason, um, sorry, I don't know if that's supposed to have HTML. <laughs> if you just go to candorharder.com and click on musical history, it's all there. Um, yeah, so with the CMC's website, for some reason you can't create a link and then go directly to that recording. I'm not sure why. So I've also included in the playlist a recording of how to navigate the CMC website um, from the link that is on my website. And then there's also a link to Alice's SoundCloud page where you can listen to the Silk Road Fantasy, um, which is a really beautiful piece. Um, yes. So, um, at, as just some closing things on Alice, um, she has, oops, um, she has won numerous national and international awards, including the 2019 Johanna Metcalf Performing Arts Prize, the 26 Louis Applebaum Orchestral Prize. This is a big one. The 2013 Dora Maver Moore Award for Outstanding Original Opera. And the Dora Awards are like the Tonys for opera in Canada. I was like, this is a big deal. Um, yeah, she's had her music performed by the Finnish Lapland Chamber Orchestra, Esprit Orchestra here in Canada, uh, China National Symphony, and pretty much all of the major symphony orchestras in Canada have played her music. Um, she's also done collaborations with um, like renowned percussionists Evelyn Glennie and Beverly Johnson and Canadian flautist Robert Aiken. Um, and she's also served as treasurer for the Canadian Association of Women Composers. Um, and on the little piece that I included on her opera, The Monkeyest King, in the playlist, um, it's a really neat piece. It's it's made to suit, um, to allow, sorry, to incorporate um, musicians from kindergarten all the way to like grade 10 plus. And the libretto is in English and in Mandarin. Um, and she combines Chinese and Western instruments again. And it just has a, such amazing sounds. Like I love her orchestrations. Um, with dark elements the piece we just listened to put on some headphones and just listen like she's got these amazing cascades of sounds that she creates and they're so unique um i just i love that piece of music especially that third movement that we we're just listening to there i could listen to that again and again um so i want to to finish this little bit here our time with um they're kind of two sides of of the discussion so Amy Beach, her, her hope was to live in a world where public would actually regard female composers' works um, and estimate the actual value of their works without reference to their color or their sex or anything like that, um, which I completely understand, right? Like we want it to be just accepted in culture where um, Alice on the other side of the coin really loves that we're having concerts dedicated exclusively to women. Um, you know, it, it sends this, this message that we are here to hear music by women and to support them. Um, you know, and so we see these two sides. It's like, I don't want to have a special concert. I just want to be programmed. But then also, it's great to highlight these voices. Where I fall on this is I think we need both. We need to have these special concerts right now while we're trying to change these centuries of, of, of prejudice and um, negative thinking, but then also have them incorporated, have everyone like complete equal um, programming. Um, yeah, I feel like we need both. Anyway, I, I thought it was really interesting that both women that um, I covered with the symphony discussion kind of on both sides of that coin so i just wanted to share that with you so now we come to the questions portion do any of you have any questions and i will do my absolute very best to answer them <laughs> and i'll drink my coffee while i wait for any typing fingers Going once, going 
price. All right, well, as always, if you have any questions, um, please feel free to contact me on social media. Um, and you can ask me there, you can contact me through my website and send me an email, that's totally all right, and I'll do my best to answer your questions. Um, thank you everyone for uh, coming in today and um, and listening, and I hope you enjoyed the music, um, and I hope you enjoyed the discussion, and I hope you all stay healthy and well, and I will see you all next week. Have a great evening, everyone. Bye-bye.